Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. This is the second of a seven part series of New Zealand wine. This episode and the next two are reviews of New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc that was sent to me in conjunction with this really cool map of Marlboro also provided for free to me from the Appalachian Marlboro Wine Organization. I have free reign to review this wine how I like. Today's wine comes from Clo Henri. Does the name Henri have some vague familiarity, especially when combined with Sauvignon Blanc? Well, well, while Marlboro is famous for Sauvignon Blanc, there's another place that's really caught some fire the past few years that's also famous for Sauvignon Blanc. That place is Sancerre, and this is the same family behind Henri Bourgeois, one of the modern pioneers of Sancerre. Well, before it was popular. The overall company is called Femille Bourgeois. In France, they also make wines from other parts of the Loire Valley in Quince, Puy Fume, Mentu Salon, and Chateau Mayant. I think I said that right. Chateau Mayant. All right, anyway. The family boasts of being in their 10th generation of winemaking. The turning point, as they say, didn't happen until the 8th generation in the 1950s. Henri Bourgeois took two hectares of vineyards in the village of Chavignol in the relatively unknown Sancerre and began expanding his holdings. His sons, Jean-Marie and Remy, joined him in the 1960s to continue that expansion, buying land and partnering with other growers in Sancerre. This caused them to gain more recognition in the area. Now, the 10th generation has joined them, Arnaud, uh, Lionel, and Jean-Christophe Bourgeois. Starting in the late 1980s, Jean-Marie and Remy were looking for other areas to make wine. The website calls it the Great Search. In 2000, they came to Marlboro. It was in the Wairo Valley that they found a place that had similar soils to Sancerre. So they purchased 98 hectares of land in the Wairo Valley that year. They decided to call it Clo Henri in honor of their father. The following year, they do their first plantings. In 2003, they harvest that planting and relocate the, an old chapel to their property. They rename it Saint Solange in honor of their mother and use it as their and used it as their first tasting room. They purchased an additional 11 hectares of hillside land directly behind their property in 2007 after already doing some other plantings on the hills behind them. This brings their total property to 109 hectares. They actually have a total of 110 hectares according to the media kit, so that must include the winery and chapel or something like that. Of that, only 44 hectares are planted to vines, with the remaining being used to plant native New Zealand species to promote a diversity on the property. In 2013, they receive organic certification for their vineyards. This is via BioGrow, which is a New Zealand organic certification company. I checked them out because I wanted to know more about them. Like many organic certification companies, they certify all kinds of industries. What I was particularly curious about was if they would be able to not just certify grapes as organic, but also a wine. In the United States, the USDA controls organic certifications. They don't do the actual certification. Third-party companies do that. However, there's a distinction between the raw materials being organic and the processing of them being organic. Other countries sometimes make that distinction, while most do not. New Zealand doesn't seem to make that distinction, at least from the laws I read and the two government websites I looked at for a while. Those are the Ministry for Primary Industries and then Food Standards Australia New Zealand. It looks like the third party company determines that. I talk about this in the first New Zealand wine episode, um, episode two of the series. Actually, no, I'm going to talk about that later on. It's originally, it was supposed to be the map, then three episodes about New Zealand wine, and then the then the wines. But I'm doing the in-depth after all the wines. So that'll be in a couple months, you'll see that. Anyway, with that said, it does seem like they follow the same standards as most places. For agriculture, the following is not allowed. Most synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, some medicines like antibiotics, growth hormones, food additives, most synthetic chemicals. Organic food also cannot be genetically modified or irradiated. 
Obviously, some of these don't apply to viticulture, but I'd like to point out the first item says most, not all. This is also pretty standard worldwide. Some of these treatments or sprays are considered organic and are certified. Additives here are under a different class, and I cover that in, the, in a future New Zealand wine episode. Basically, they all allow the same sort of things the U.S. does. They, there are plenty of links to go down that rabbit hole yourself or watch in a few weeks or a couple months that, that first episode about New Zealand wine. The point here is that they are farming organically. BioGrow appears to also certify organic processing and that will have a separate label. This isn't to call out or criticize Cloanry, just making sure that we're all on the same page. The most important part is that the grapes are certified organic. Now, Cloanry appears to be working towards biodynamic certification, or at least they have started practicing some of it. Part of that is setting aside land for biodiversity. They also talk about their winemaking being very low interventionist. They state that they use very few additives and they do not fine or filter their wines. Because they don't use any fining materials, their wines are automatically vegan or vegetarian. They state that the wines are made using organic and biodynamic practices. So again, any kind of additive would be classified as either or both. I'm confident that they are not heavily manipulating their wines and only making any necessary adjustments in a minimal fashion. They are also part of a small group of Marlboro wineries called MANA, M-A-N-A, uh, wine growers. It started as a way to share ideas with each other about organic and bio winemaking, eventually becoming more organized. Essentially, this group of uh, five wineries grows organic and bio along with 100% of the wines grown and produced in Marlboro. So no, I can't be a winery elsewhere that has a vineyard in Marlboro and trucks off grapes to like Auckland or someplace to make wine, even if I meet the other criteria. Well, why? Well, for organic and bio winemaking, where the wine is made, especially for biodynamic, that's also important for native yeasts. Okay, let's talk about their property. It's composed of two types of soil, Otira glacial stones and Waimanga windblown clay. There's a fault line that runs diagonally along the main plots that divides the two soils. The hills behind the winery are also made of the Waimanga clay. They classify the two plots of Waimanga clay. The flat plain in the front of the winery is called Broadbridge clay, and the hills have wither clay. This clay was formed over 250,000 years ago from glacial outwash fans that were eroded over time. The Otira glacial stones are from 75,000 years ago during the Otira glacial period. Same thing happened, an outwash was deposited along the plains. The Wairu Fault essentially divides these two soils along the flat plain. The hills behind the winery also mark the boundary between the Wairu Valley and the Southern Valleys. Today's wine comes from the Otira Vineyard. Cloanry is also part of the Appalachian Marlboro Wine Group, as are the other two wines in this series. So all wines are 100% Marlboro grapes. This is to ensure that less expensive Sauvignon Blanc grapes from outside of Marlboro are not being blended. New Zealand allows up to 15% of grapes to be from a different GI to be used. Let's get the stats for this wine. The 2022 Clo Henri Otira Sauvignon Blanc suggested retail price is $25. It's from the Marlboro GI. It's 100% Sauvignon Blanc, Otira Vineyard, soil, glacial stones, vine age 13 to 18 years old. The yields 8 tons per hectare. That comes out to 3.24 tons per acre. Climate is dry maritime with warm sunny days and cool nights. Vintage rainfall was 309 millimeters or 12.2 inches versus an average of 387 millimeters or 15.2 inches. No irrigation. Sunlight hours, uh, 2,523 hours for the vintage versus an average of 2,470. Fermentation, 85% is in stainless steel, 15% native yeast in old French barrels and Austrian oak demi moods that are 600 liters. Age surly, eight months with lees stirring. Additional six months aging in tank and barrel prior to bottling. ABV is 13.5%. The aging potential is five to 10 years from the vintage. I kind of cool they've included things like climate, rainfall, yield, and sunlight hours. Don't really get those stats uh, most of the time. The rainfall average for them is well below Marlboro's entire region average of 655 millimeters or 25.8 inches. Sunlight hours for the entire region uh, average 2,409, so well above that. So this brings up no irrigation, 12 inches for this year, and their average of 15 inches are both 
below the typical requirement of 20 inches per year for viticulture. They don't specifically address this vintage, but they do say that because of the organic farming, lack of irrigation, and the age of the vines, the roots of their vines will tend to go deeper than conventionally farmed and irrigated vines will. This allows the vines to be more drought tolerant, and I know this is a, a true fact. The additional aging allows the solids to settle, eliminating the need for fining and filtering. All right, so now let's get into the wine. So obviously I have all three wines on display here, but we're only doing one wine at a time. As I always say, I'm super excited to try the wines. But this really because of the um, pedigree from Sancerre. Uh, these guys, you know, make a, a range of wines and their Sancerres. They have um, like a single vineyard one that runs around 60 some odd dollars. So we've got some, you know, we've got some really good wine making here. Oh my goodness. Well, we're just gonna leave that in for right now and I'll remove it after the video. All right, so uh, color wise, well, I mean, color looks great on here um, as far as any tiering. Got that medium going on there. So we're on a 30, 13 some odd percent, right? For, um, for ABV. 13 and a half. Yeah, absolutely. So on the nose, I'll call it like moderate, kind of a moderate, uh, intensity, but it is definitely youthful and you get some great, uh, fruit out of it. It's, it's, it's a fruit smelling. It's, it smells like fruit. Um, it's a bit of a citrus thing going on, kind of an orange thing. Also orange pith. I don't get much else. So, um, I was drinking some of that. I, I finished that, that, um, Bordeaux, that white Bordeaux I had for, for the special, for the Christmas special. That thing is just super intense on the nose. Like this one is, this one's a little more muted. Um, so I get, I get, I get the orange, get the orange pith. It's a citrusy, but I don't really get any, like any type of grassiness or anything else. Let's just get on the palate. No palate cleanser first there. It tastes good though. Hmm. Hmm. So it's a lot of citrus. You got the lemon lime all the time. Um, really no apple pear there, but um, get the lemon lime. You got the, you got the, you got the um, orange. Um, you have a little bit of a tropical fruit thing going on. You got a little bit of a, a guava, uh, papaya mango. It's, it's not as high as the, it's the citrus stuff. Acidity ripping high. Well, yeah, it's, it's high. Um, which, you know, good Sancerre, sorry, good Sauvignon Blanc just in general, but, uh, Marlboro for sure definitely gets ripping high acidity. So does Sancerre, but Marlboro really gets ripping high acidity a lot of times. I get a little bit of hay to this, um, a little grassiness to it, more dried grass, like, you know, like hay. Um, so not like fresh cut grass, but dried out grass, uh, that might have been harvested that they you know, is going to be used for livestock or something like that. There is a minerality to it, like crushed rock, um, almost like, um, uh, almost not, not almost, there's a salinity to it. So like crushed oyster shell, that type of thing. It's super delicious. It's definitely on the lighter side. So it's not like in your face on these aromas and flavors, but it tastes really good now. And these wines have been sitting out for well, almost an hour now. So they're not ice cold by any means. We actually had a great, great uh, serving temperature. Um, probably for evaluation, it'd be better to have a little, have this one a little bit warmer. Oh yeah. I get a little bit of um, like papaya skin, mango skin, a uh, little peach going on here too, a little fuzz. You know what you haven't heard me say yet? Pyrazine. Don't really get much. I mean, there's a there's a slight pepper, bell pepper thing going on, but it's not an over the top thing. This is very, very, very slight, very subtle. It's not the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, whatever um, flavor or aroma. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty buried in there. So if I was, if I was doing a uh, exam, if I was doing an exam, I probably would 
intrinsically know this is Sauvignon Blanc, but I might be a little confused as to where it came from. Um, only just because the stereotypical Sauvignon Blancs we get, especially in New Zealand, um, tend to have judicious amounts of that bell pepper. Now, this is probably a conscious winemaking decision on their part, because honestly, sometimes it's just too much. Like, I love, I love the pyrazines in my wines, but if it's all I smell and all I taste, it's not balanced. It's, it's, it's over the top. It's not really what I'm looking for. Um, so, and that's just anything. Like if it's just over the top on any one or two particular aromas and flavors, sometimes it's just, it's hard to concentrate anything else with the wine. There's to be a balance. There's more balance in this wine. Um, everything's kind of like at, at kind of like, uh, equalize around the same. Like no, no one's really like a star of the show. Uh, you don't have somebody that's ripping out a, a, a guitar solo for 10 minutes, right? But yeah, I mean, it's unmistakably Sauvignon Blanc, especially when I smell it now and when I taste it, it just lacks the, the pyrazine. This is very, very little, but it's delicious. And what, 25 bucks? Yeah. It really does is get some of that tropical fruit coming in at the end. Um, it's citrusy up front and then a little bit later on you're getting that, that, that papaya, mango, guava and that's really what centers me into like this is Sauvignon Blanc as far as a testable wine and then at that point I might throw this into Sancerre I might throw this in New Zealand um, there's only two places that we are now allowed to have Sauvignon Blanc we can't have California anymore um, so I might be a little bit confused but probably gut, i throw it into New Zealand. The, the court's kind of changing things up in New World, Old World, so um, I'm not, I don't think I'll be doing a video about it, but if you want to check out their new, their new grid, um, look it up. I don't think there's a link in the, there's a link or anything like that, but it's a delicious wine. If you can find this wine, I think you should get it. It's, it's, really, it's really killer, as I kind of put it off to the side there. There, there we go. Um, all right, that's going to do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and then tell your friends and we'll see you next time with an empty glass of Chlor Henri. <laughs>